So as we as we agreed, we will start with uh, Philip, with uh, each of you having a, a short uh, introductory remark. So please, go ahead. Thanks. It's great to be here. Um, as you all know, the EU had a problem with democracy uh, even before uh, the financial crisis. A decade ago, for example, uh, the French and the Dutch voted no uh, to the EU constitution, uh, and yet most of the constitution uh, was enacted in any case through the Lisbon Treaty. But the problem has got much, much worse uh, since the crisis, uh, especially uh, in uh, the Eurozone. Catastrophic uh, policies have been imposed uh, by Chancellor Angela Merkel's government in Berlin, uh, the unelected uh, European Commission in Brussels, and the unaccountable uh, European Central Bank uh, in Frankfurt, which have transformed a financial crisis which has affected all of the Western world uh, into a much deeper uh, economic and political crisis uh, in uh, the Eurozone. And you can see that in many countries, support for the EU has plunged to historic lows, um, that many Europeans now associate the EU uh, with austerity, recession, German domination, with undemocratic constraints on what people can do, rather than how we can all achieve more together. And many Europeans no longer trust the competence, uh, the motives, and the integrity uh, of Eurozone policymakers who failed to prevent the crisis, have so far failed uh, to uh, resolve it, uh, who bailed out banks and their creditors while imposing misery on ordinary voters, uh, but not uh, on themselves. So the, des the Eurozone desperately needs to change, but flawed rules dysfunctional institutions, groupthink, and German bullying prevented. And in the, and in the absence of mainstream alternatives uh, to Merkelism, nationalists, uh, extremists, uh, and charlatans uh, are thriving. Now, by far the worst hit country uh, is Greece. Greece has been insolvent uh, since 2010. And normally, uh, when a country cannot pay its debt, it defaults uh, or it negotiates a write-down with its creditors. That's what happened with Poland uh, in 1991, or indeed uh, with Germany uh, in 1953. But when Greece's public debt problems came to a head in 2010, a very different approach was taken. To avoid losses for French and German banks, Eurozone policymakers decided to pretend that Greece was merely going through uh, temporary funding difficulties. And under the pretense that the financial stability of the Eurozone as a whole was at risk, they decided to breach the legal basis on which the Euro was formed, the no bailout rule, which st stipulates that governments should not bail out uh, their peers and to lend European taxpayers' money to Greece, ostensibly out of solidarity, but actually to bail out those foreign banks. Further loans from EU governments followed to Ireland, uh, Portugal, uh, and Spain, primarily to bail out local banks that would otherwise have defaulted uh, on uh, their borrowing from German and French banks. And what happened there is crucial because the bad lending of private banks became obligations between governments. And a crisis that could have united Europe in a collective effort to curb the banks that got, it, got us into this mess has instead divided it.
pitting creditor countries, primarily Germany, against debtor ones, with EU institutions which are meant to represent the collective European interest, instead becoming instruments for creditors to impose their will on debtors. In effect, the Eurozone has become a glorified debtor's prison. And along the way, European policymakers have behaved outrageously. They forced out the elected prime ministers of Italy and Greece and replaced them with unelected technocrats who would do their bidding. The unaccountable Troika has run crisis-hit countries as quasi-colonies. And policymakers have illegally threatened to deprive Greeks, Irish, and by extension everyone else, of the right to use their own currency, the euro, unless they submitted to iniquitous conditions. So you see that Greece has made to suffer, been to suffer, made to suffer huge suffering in order to, to try to service an unbearable debt burden. Or Irish people have had 64 billion euros in bank debt imposed on them. That's 14,000 euros for every man, woman and child uh, in Ireland. And if you think about it, taking advantage of people's desire to be European and their fear of being forced out of the euro to impose iniquitous conditions on them is the very opposite of the solidarity on which the European project is meant to be based. So it's tragic, but hardly surprising, that as a result, Germany and EU institutions are now resented so much in debtor countries. It's also understandable that Northern European taxpayers are angry that their money has been lent to Southern Europe. But they shouldn't blame Southern Europe for that. They should blame the banks that their loans in effect bailed out and the policymakers who made it happen. And the tragedy is that Northern European taxpayers now have an incentive to resist the debt relief that Greece needs to recover, or that they would lose out if the 64 billion euros unjustly imposed on Irish taxpayers was cut. So in effect, by placing the interests of private banks ahead of those of ordinary citizens, Eurozone policymakers have set Europeans against each other. Now, while Greece has suffered the most, the Eurozone as a whole is now locked in to an undemocratic fiscal straitjacket. This is unnecessary because the EU's fiscal rules did not fail except in not spotting the Greek government's lying. The crisis was a crisis of financial failures, not except in Greece of fiscal failures. But because of that terrible mistake to breach the no bailout rule, Germans feared that they would be liable for everyone else's debts. And so Chancellor Merkel demanded much greater control over other countries' budgets, and the European Commission was only happy, uh, too happy uh, to oblige. Now this has two problems. The first is that it's economically dangerous because if you share a currency, you need more fiscal flexibility, not less. And it's politically poisonous because whenever voters reject a government, as they have done at nearly every occasion during the crisis, the first thing that happens even before the new government is in office is that EU officials pop up on television and say, you must stick to exactly the same policies of the government that you have just rejected. Now imagine how that makes you feel. Remote, unelected, scarcely accountable officials in Brussels are denying voters legitimate democratic choices about taxation and spending. Inevitably, that alienates people from the EU. And if voting for mainstream parties doesn't bring about change, it's not surprising that people are turning to the extremes. The third democratic problem in the Eurozone is the ECB. 
which is the most extremely independent central bank in the world. Now, there's a big difference between an independent central bank like we have in Poland or in Britain. They have independence to conduct their ordinary operations, but ultimately they are subservient to the government. They are part of the government. But the unelected ECB does not have a political master. There is no Eurozone government, and instead it floats above the 19 national governments. It pays some heed to Berlin, but not to others. And you see, for example, that when panic ripped through the Eurozone between 2010 and 2012, the central bank did what is inconceivable that any other central bank would do, which is to sit on its hands and let that panic spread until eventually in 2012 it intervened. Or you see a central bank that dictates to politicians in areas that have nothing to do with monetary policy, saying, as Jean-Claude Trichet did, for example, that debt restructuring was inconceivable within the Eurozone, and if it happened, that he would act to make it even more costly than it was. That is meddling in politics, which central banks should not do. And this extreme independence is entrenched in a treaty that can only be revised if all 28 member governments um, agree, parliaments too, and in some cases, a, a referendum. That kind of immense power in the hands of unelected officials demands proper accountability. Yet again, compared how the ECB is accountable to the, the Fed in the United States or the Bank of England in Britain, all the ECB does, it has a dialogue, not hearings, with the European Parliament, and it doesn't, is not legally obliged to provide enough information so that, for it to be properly held uh, to account. And last but not least, ECB officials cannot be sanctioned for failing in their duties uh, or overstepping them politically. So let me conclude. European integration inevitably involves constraints on national decision making. But pooling sovereignty should not mean curtailing democracy. Decisions taken at a European level need to be open, accountable, and involve democratic choice. So instead of a Eurozone run in Germany's narrow interest as a creditor, we need a monetary union that works for all its citizens. That means restructuring banks, writing down unbearable debts, increasing investment, and boosting productivity. It means getting rid of the fiscal straitjacket, allowing governments to, to borrow more freely, and ultimately pay the consequences it by defaulting if they run up too big debts. And it means the ECB should act like a proper central bank, which means it needs to be more accountable, it shouldn't med meddle in politics. And my final word is that I can understand why people here in Poland want to be part of the Euro, some of them do at least, because they think it's part of being European. This is a golden age for Poland. You've never been more economically successful. You are treated more or less as an equal uh, by Germany. If you join the Euro, a dysfunctional monetary union as it is now, suddenly you will lose control over your economy and suddenly you will become subservient to Germany politically. That is not in your interests and ultimately it's not in the interests of the Eurozone in the European Union. So I urge you uh, not to do it uh, until the Eurozone has been fixed. Thank you. Well, it's all German's fault, so it is very proper to ask Jan Werner Müller to, uh, well, maybe not to respond, but to have his part. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you in particular for the um, unusual opportunity to try to save democracy underneath a disco ball. There's a lot of um, comparative crisis talk these days. Is the refugee crisis a bigger crisis than the Euro crisis? Is one of the two a bigger challenge to the European Union? I'm not sure how productive these kinds of comparisons are, but I am pretty sure that in a sense both crises point to the same underlying, if you like, structural problem in Europe today.
And that underlying structural problem is how to manage, or if you don't like this kind of managerial bureaucratic language, how to politically tame interdependence or spillover, if you, um, if you like. As Philippe just pointed out, um, what we have de facto at the moment is in a sense a highly perverse situation. A project that was meant to unite Europeans has turned into a machine that continuously sets nation states against each other, or at least so the perception goes. It basically has become a machine that reproduces or exaggerates national conflict when it should have tamed or ultimately abolished them. More particularly, let me try to suggest that maybe a helpful way to think about this current challenge analytically might be to kind of divide, divide um, two possible approaches of how to manage or politically tame interdependence. One is with rules, and the other one is with an attempt at supranational, if you like, pan-European politics. I'll try to explain in a second what these mean more particularly. I think what we de facto again have right now is, of course, a system of rules, both in the, Euro, in the Eurozone and then, as you all know, with Dublin with regard to refugees, asylum, and so on and so forth. In both cases, we know that the rules aren't really observed. Everybody is admitting this now in the case of Dublin, in the case of the Eurozone, we have basically been lurching from moment to moment where somebody said, okay, but if we make the rules even tighter, if we have even more oversight by Brussels, um, then next time they really are, going to, really are going to work. That in a sense has been the story of the last half decade or so. I think we have every reason to believe that also in the future, these rules will not really be observed. So one alternative might be pan-European politics to work out basically different approaches to managing interdependence. The problem is that the EU as we have it at the moment, structurally, institutionally, isn't capable of pan-European politics. It is only capable, ultimately, of national politics, with small exceptions here and there. I'm not saying that the elections of the Parliament, European Parliament last year were completely meaningless in terms of pan-European politics, but they clearly are not what you might imagine, or could imagine, or should imagine, as a way of coming to some kind of pan-European approach to manage inter, uh, inter, uh, interdependence. Now, granted, you might come back to me and say, look, rules on the, one, on the one side, politics on the other is a false dichotomy. I concede that point, because in a sense, the rules, of course, ultimately are the outcome of politics. And if we had pan-European politics in a more genuine sense, eventually that would also produce different kinds of rules. The difference is, of course, in the level of legitimacy. It's one thing to impose rules in the name of some kind of depersonalized, depoliticized technocratic reason. It's another thing to say that these rules were ultimately agreed on the basis of the usual things, a pan-European debate, pan-European election campaigns, and so on. So I'm gonna, at least in this first part of my remarks, end up with something very conventional, namely that the way to go from here is indeed what a lot of people have been saying over the last couple of years, which is to slowly but surely move to something like the European Commission becoming a European government. Now, by definition, that means that some of the functions of the Commission right now, the really legitimately more technocratic functions, the role that the EU Commission has as a guardian of the treaties, they basically have to go somewhere else, or they will have to be spun off because like administrative agencies in many nation states, they cannot be at the same time be seen as entirely partisan or politicized. Now why this is, I think, important and hopefully in the minds of most people eventually inevitable is that the status quo is bound to undermine the EU in at least two senses. I already talked about the constant reproduction of national conflict. But there's a more perhaps subtle problem namely the constant undermining of the rule of law. If people are seen to be breaking the rules, if as happened in the Eurozone many times, the existing rules are bent or suspended or treaties are all of a sudden concluded entirely outside the EU framework, sort of typical emergency legislation stuff, 
which, you know, for most people, it doesn't seem to be the obvious issue right now, given that the conflict seemed to be about people actually suffering on the ground in Athens, etc. Granted, but remember, that the European project was always a law-driven project, that over many decades, when there was no, for shorthand, political will, it was basically the European court that kept driving it. So if you start undermining the rule of law in Europe, you really are striking at the core of what the EU ultimately is. And I think that's one of the reasons why, for instance, as of last year, we have a vice president of the commission who's supposed to be in charge of the rule of law, which in a sense is not obvious. I mean, many countries don't have you know, some high-level official who says, I'm here to protect the rule of law. Many people think that you know, it sort of should be all right by itself, or we have judges, or we have other, other means of doing this. Now, shifting to a slightly but not entirely different issue as a second set of remarks um, by way of opening our discussion today. Um, of course, sometimes European Commission officials have also talked about a rule of law crisis in quite another sense. And I partly bring this up because what they're talking about is the kind of thing that might soon come to a country near you. Well, actually, it already has come to a country near you. It might come to you, the country that you happen to be living in right now. I'm, of course, talking about the particular challenge of the rule of law and ultimately also democracy deteriorating within a member state, within a member state, which sometimes might and sometimes might not be a result of the overall rule of law crisis in Europe that has partly been created by the, by the Euro crisis. Everybody agrees by now that the EU has no terribly convincing approaches, or as the phrase usually goes, instruments, uh, again, very managerial language, of course, no instruments to deal with challenges such as the Orban government since 2010. Now, interestingly here as well, it might be helpful to think about the challenge in terms of rules on the one side and politics on the other. In this case, I think we have to conclude from past experience that on the one hand, politics doesn't actually work in this case. What do I mean? I mean that one could have imagined a scenario where if something tends to go wrong in a country, it's basically our supranational party families that sort of take on the role of having a word with some of their members, maybe behind closed doors. This is basically what, to some degree, the European People's Party has been trying to do with Hungary, but clearly without success. And it must be said, ultimately, the importance of having 12 votes in the European Parliament from Fidesz seemed to be much more important than guarding what is commonly referred to as EU fundamental values. So politics in this sense doesn't work on this occasion. And instead, I think we have here a situation where guardianship of rules in a depoliticized way is much more plausible. So calling for more political Europe doesn't mean that now everything has to be politicized. We have to kind of be careful about what kind of particular challenges we're looking at. Or, to put the point differently, politics means, of course, on one level, having choices. It means, therefore, pluralism, because without any pluralism, you know, where are the choices? But it also means pluralism within agreed parameters. And if some move beyond these parameters, as has happened in Hungary, it's entirely legitimate for actors who are not themselves, let's say, democratically elected or even accountable in a direct way to basically start to guard these parameters. A last remark, if I may, about something, as one tends to say, completely different. Um, but it was, inspired, it was inspired by reading through the description of this entire event here. Um, because yes, we're saving democracy underneath the disco ball, um, but one of the other themes, if I understood it correctly, is also about urbanism and cities. And so here's one last thought that actually goes back to democracy in Europe, but maybe something that some of you want to take up as something that isn't sort of usually discussed in this, in this context. So democracy, as we all know, is a matter of institutions. But it's also a matter of the imagination. To some degree, you have to imagine yourself as part of some kind of collective actor. Now, one thing that I think has been brought home to us with a vengeance in the last couple of years in particular, 
is that while of course we never see the entire collective actor anywhere in action, we never see the people as a whole appear anywhere. They couldn't for obvious practical, uh, practical reasons. And yet what we've learned is that symbolically it remains terribly, terribly important that there are scenarios or if you like more particularly public spaces where people can appear in such a way that it's plausible to think of them as instantiating the people as a whole. You all know what I'm thinking of. Um, I'm thinking of, for instance, in Tagma Square, Plaza del Sol, or indeed Maidan. Now, one curious thing about the EU is that beyond the usual debates about do we have a public sphere or not, which I think we have more of now than we had five years ago. I think we know more about, let's say, Greece than we knew five years ago in all of Europe. I mean, that, you know, the uh, point is not that, oh, it was worth having the Euro crisis because now, you know, I know, you know five minutes more worth more of Greek history than before. Of course not. But that's one thing. But it's interesting that in a sense there is nothing that could even remotely be imagined as the public space for Europeans to gather, to protest, to do anything. Um, and that's not simply due to the fact that the institutions themselves, of course, are somewhat, uh, are somewhat dispersed and don't tend to get together on a day-to-day -day level. It's an interesting, I hope, thing to think about that all countries, despite enormous internal diversity, that eventually managed uh, to somehow politically tame interdependence also have that particular kind of public space. So just think of the obvious example, the US and the National Mall and what that means and how important, in a sense, the, the so-called long march on Washington is as really a kind of political institution in the, American, in the American context. We just recently had one a couple of days ago, another million man march on, uh, on DC. What could we even remotely imagine in a European context? Yes, we have our European Citizens Initiative where you know, if you can collect uh, one million uh, signatures minus one, your own, you know, you're on the way to influencing the Commission. Great. Um, but maybe there are other ways of reimagining our, our politics that go beyond, again, these somewhat more managerial or bureaucratic approaches. Thanks for your attention. I just want to explain before I pass it to Ivan Krastev the disco ball, uh, because uh, saving democracy is not only necessary, but it also could be fun, uh, <laughs> as we prove here. <laughs> Ivan, please. Listen, after Britain and Germany have spoken, uh, what you expect from a Bulgarian. Uh, but my idea is that uh, there is one important uh, characteristics of the national experiences. And what, in my view, distinguishes my Bulgarian view of what's going on is that I have a much more high tolerance for mess and messiness. Uh, and from this point of view, saving, succeeding, I do believe surviving is important enough. Rainer Maria Rilke used to say, who speaks of victory? To endure is all. And from this point of view, it's quite interesting because these seven years have been very dramatic for the European Union. Uh, just Philip was telling me uh, an hour ago that in economic terms, seven years ago, European Union used to be 32% of the global GDP. Now this is around 21% of the global GDP. This is a level of decline that is amazing. Seven years in which basically we were so much looking at ourselves that we didn't see to what extent we have become less important for the world as a whole. But there are two different stories about what happened. One is some people say everything happened and nothing changed. You have a lot of crises, you have a Greek crisis, you have a refugee crisis, but if you try to see what was this type of a change on the way the European Union is functioning, you're going to see status quo much more repackaged than basically reformed. And the others are going to see everything changed, but nothing happened, which means that we still survive as a union. My story is much more simple. I, I try to claim four very simple things. First is that the most important aspect of the financial crisis with respect to the European project is not seen so much in economic and institutional terms, but it is psychological. And I very much agree that we are talking about the crisis of interdependency. Seven years ago, we were seeing interdependence as the answers of the problems. Now we see interdependence as the problem. <laughs> 
let's give you the example from security area. Seven years ago, we were happy that we basically are buying Russian gas because for us this was the way to moderate Russia and to be sure that Russia is not going to use force. Now basically we see the fact that you're buying the gas from Russia as a source of insecurity. And this is on all these levels, what yesterday was valued as an answer, now is becoming a problem. Not that the things change so much, but our perception of the world in which we are living is changing a lot. For example, in 2010, the Eurobarometer showed that 60% of Europeans believe that their kids are going to have a life which is worse than their own. This is a major change. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future? Very much changes the perspective of what kind of policies are going to work or not work. When Germans was suggesting certain type of structural changes to the South and Europe, their major argument was, we are not asking you more than we asked East Europeans in the 1990s. The difference is that in 1990s, Eastern Europe was optimistic. We basically expected the future to be much better. When the Southern Europe basically has a pessimistic expectations, these same policies are perceived in a totally different uh, uh, fashion. I'm saying this because in my view, the biggest problem that the European Union is facing today is that we have four crises, which has a totally different logic, by the way, totally different models of German uh, leadership, which I'm going to, uh, to, uh, uh, to hint to. And the biggest problem is how to in a certain way, I don't know how is the English word when you have this guy with the different balls, the yeah, juggler. So you had the financial crisis, uh, the euro crisis, and Greece is the name of this crisis. You had the refugee crisis, you had the Russia-Ukrainian crisis, and also you have, in a certain way, the British crisis, the idea of the referendum, is Britain going to stay or leave? All this crisis has a different logic of its own, and they're dividing Europe in a totally different way. Euro crisis divided Europe on creditors and debtors, on north and south. The problem with this division is that you can have a union between poor and rich. You cannot have a political equality between the debtor and the creditor because it's a power relationship. So as a result of it, Europe ended up with two classes of voters. They are voters that matter, and this is the voters in the northern states, and they are voters that does not matter and this is the voters in the southern states. And from this point of view, the Syriza case is the greatest example of this. It's not simply that they voted in one way, but the problem is that their own government, which they elected on this platform, became the major demonstration that basically it cannot uh, be different. But here, the second crisis, for example, the Russian crisis, and here Germany acted very much in its interest. But look at the Russian crisis. Here the difference is totally different because you have north-south uh, dimension, you have dimension uh, division within Eastern Europe itself, but Germany decided to act against its very obvious economic interest in order to show its capacity for leadership. They sacrificed the special relationship with Russia in order to kind of reassure Central and Eastern Europe is that European Union matter. The basic, is, the basic question is how we can be sure that the losers of the Euro crisis, I mean the Greeks, are going to be ready to show solidarity with the Baltics or the Poles if they believe that there was not solidarity with them during the financial crisis. Are they not going, for example, in January 31 vote against prolonging the sanctions because they don't believe that they own anything, anybody anymore? And then you go with the refugee crisis, which is also a very interesting crisis because this is the only one which is a pan-European crisis. And the refugee crisis, in my view, showed the most important kind of a gap in the current European reality. In order to solve the crisis, you need a common European policy. But the major result of the crisis is a total renationalization of the public sentiments. There is not a single society in Europe who believes that Brussels is going to save them better when it comes to the migration issues than their national government nevertheless of the nature of the government. And I do believe these type of problems uh, are standing in front of the European Union and just to make these declarations that democracy is the one that is going to save the EU. Sounds slightly what I remember from my uh, first years in the university where the major slogan was, we're going to solve the problem with socialism with more socialism. <laughs> 
obviously it's not simply about talking democracy empowering here and there, but it is finding a certain balance for these projects to survive. And from this point of view, it's not going to be up to one principle. They are not a silver bullet through which it's going to be done. It's going to be done through different type of balancing between the interests of the parties, between the interests of the people, between the interests of the countries. I'm saying this and I want to make one more point. When all this started, there was two hypotheses. One was that the financial crisis is going strongly to destabilize the major authoritarian regimes. I mean Chinese, Russians, because basically, to a great extent, it was believed that their legitimacy was very much dependent on their capacity to provide people with economic goods. This was clear in the case of China, but even in the case of Russia, before 2009, the major legitimacy of the regime was based on the fact that uh, economic well-being of the people has very much improved as a result of the high oil prices. There was a second group of uh, scholars who claim that financial crisis is going to be much more painful for democracies and that basically you're going to see many of the especially new democratic regimes collapsing in the emergence of authoritarian states because the people are going to be very much hurt by the crisis and they're going to react. I do believe that we saw something which is third in nature. And this is the changes of the legitimacy of some of the authoritarian regime very much, I do believe Crimea divorced, for example, the support uh, of uh, President Putin from the economic performance of the government on one side, and also the changing logic of governance within the democracies. So both in the authoritarian world and in European Union world, we ended up with there is no alternative. The difference was that in European Union, we say there is no policy alternative which means that you can change as many governments as you want. Basically, you can change governments any six months. What you cannot change is economic policies. In China and Russia, the version of there is no alternative was, we are ready to change economic policies. And to be honest, they are much more flexible when it comes to economic policies under the one condition. They should not be attempt to change the ruling political class. Which of this type of a two there is no alternative option is going to be more viable, we are going to see, but I don't believe that the world is gaining out of the fact that there, there, is two, there is no alternatives competing with each other than basically having some alternatives around. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm not inclined to speak after, after such a panelist that did really well without any moderation. Uh, but I will, I will, well, nevertheless, I will pose some questions. Um, well, first of all, it's, it seems to that perhaps the European Union was, well, from the, from the very beginning, a very elitist project, a uh, project of elites. And it could actually function pretty well as long as elites in democracy were, uh, well, more important than they are today, to put it mildly. Um, and the question, well, there, there are a couple of questions, but the first one would be whether European Union can survive uh, becoming uh, the mass politics, finally, because we can, we can argue in the 50s and the 60s the politics were very different than they are today. And, and then there is another question, whether the, in the politics, politics at least it seems recently and it's always been like this, are about emotions and if you speak about European Union, the, the only emotion it, in, it can evoke is um, you can be either, either pro-European or anti-European, but we, don't, we can't speak about European policy as such because there's not like a socialist European policy or liberal European policy. There is either European or national policy. And it reminds me of, of an article which, which my, my partner just sent me. She, 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 wrote, she writes about Spain and she wrote about the recent Catalan, you know, the recent fiesta in Catalonia. Uh, they, they have national, uh, national celebration. And also in, in, Octo in, uh, in the October, I think it was 14, well, just very recently, a couple of days ago, there was like a Spanish day of uh, independence. And seeing like 
tens of thousands of people in, in Barcelona in comparison with very boring uh, celebration with, well, king and the army, but kind of very proper, very proper and very boring celebration. Kind of like Habermas celebration of citizen, you know, because the citizen concepts is actually not evoking a lot of emotions. However, the national politics, nationalism, evokes a lot of emotions. And I was, I was thinking why actually there are so very few committed and skilled pro-European uh, leaders. And there are so many skilled, like Orban, like Farage, like uh, Marine Le Pen, and some others, anti-European politics. Uh, politicians. Perhaps being in the, such a position as they are is much easier than being responsible politician, pro-European, who actually rules. But uh, perhaps also emotions are much stronger and easier on, and it will be stupid for a politician to avoid them, not to pursue something that seems so completely stupid. I agree that, uh, that being renationalization of politics seems uh, it's an, it's an obvious, it's a no choice when you have to have European solution, but for a politician who wants to stay in power, it's, it's natural. So, therefore, the question is whether the, the reasons for creating the European Union are, uh, um, well, in a way, already accomplished. There is a peace in Europe. And, and actually, uh, the, the nations, when the politics become really uh, decided by the masses, not by the elites, in the era of, of well, internet and tabloids, simply European Union could not convince these masses today. And the problem is that we are stuck with the status quo, and uh, which is unsustainable anymore. And we have to choose whether to do what Jan Werner Miller suggested, uh, which I would, I would support, creating the European solution, or perhaps something that Philip didn't openly argue for, which is dismantling the, the euro. But it seems that we have to choose between the two possibilities, because the, the, what we have is unsustainable anymore. So the, the question maybe, I will try to, well, sorry for this long remark, I don't really believe in questions, but I would like to, I would like to first ask, um, well, Jan Werner Miller to react, but a very direct question about the German, because German was mentioned here a lot of times. And is, is Germany, can Germany really try to play the role of the hegemon, an unwilling hegemon that is imposed on the Germany? Or, uh, or it's, or actually, um, is, is Germany capable of, of solving this in the way that all Germany solved, of being more European? Of, of, because German policy in Europe was always, the, well, supporting the Federation or at least supporting more Europe. Now it seems it, it, it's not willing to. And whether you, you would like, because we didn't react actually to accusations of Philip, that, that, that the whole, well, imposing German rule on everyone, it cannot function on, on the, on the, inside the Eurozone as a whole. Uh, so, uh, yes, would you, like to, would you like to respond to that? And, and then I will move to, to other panelists. Actually, I'm not going to react to the accusation now either because I'm not a spokesperson for the, for the German government, which I have criticized along very similar lines, if not quite the same language myself. But allow me to say two things about what you started us off with, and then maybe I will say something about, about Germany. Um, origins of, of European integration. Um, in a lot of debates like this, history will, of course, at least come in through the back door. And it's not trivial how we tell the story. Not because of the usual cliche that we need you know, the right narrative for Europe and then everything will be sorted out. No, but because we might in a sense of expectations for what Europe is or has been that historically are just false. So you talked about the origins as being elitist, which in many ways is of course true. Uh, at the same time, it's important to remember that European integration at the beginning was not about democracy. There was no democracy talk in the 50s when it came to the European community. There was a very clear division 
the European community does peace and prosperity. So it was political, of course, but it only did that. And the Council of Europe did democracy and human rights. It was a very clear division of labor. And for peace and prosperity, it was basically a project where everybody could feel we're all winners in this. Of course, if you were a peasant, if you were a certain kind of person in, in the middle class, you were even more of a winner. But it didn't obviously generate any strong opposition along the lines that we so easily see in our politics today. Now, ironically, you might say, one of the things that has happened in between is that the EU kind of grabbed human rights at some point and said, we're going to become more legitimate if we also do all this other nice stuff. And nowadays, people automatically look to the EU to fulfill all kinds of normative purposes in and around Europe. And the Council of Europe is basically an impoverished, marginalized institution in many, in many ways. Um, so I think that needs to complicate our picture a little bit of what happened initially and what changed, uh, what changed over time. Yes, it was elitist, but that, wasn't not, that was not necessarily seen as a problem. Second quick, quick remark in, in response to what you said. Um, how do we bring in the masses? Or, God forbid, how do we emotionalize the masses to be more pro-European? That sounds a little bit like you know, the kind of stuff that Vivian Rading used to, to, to do and, and talk about. You know, here's my five-year plan for you know, making people enthusiastic about Europe. You know, more town hall meetings and a nice sticker and more flags and so on. I think this is utterly hopeless. Okay? Um, I think what we are really facing today, specifically, is a kind of fateful confrontation between, for shorthand, technocracy on the one hand and populism on the other. Okay? So here's one right solution for everything technocratically and then the people supposedly react against that. All right? A diagnosis that everybody can hopefully agree with. Now, one thing that maybe is less obvious is that populism and technocracy actually have one thing in common. They both basically say there's only one right solution or there is only one voice of the people. And both these attitudes are profoundly undemocratic. Democracy as we know it still, it might change over time, but what we still know as democracy in Europe today is party democracy. And while we can lament the weakening of parties in all kinds of contexts, we still have that. And we actually don't have either mass politics or pure elite politics. But we have a kind of looming scenario where that could be the opposition. So I think one thing that actually would be important to think about is how to strengthen party democracy. So again, I end up with something that I realize is very much conventional wisdom in a certain way. Strengthen the European Parliament, having a more genuine European party democracy, and so on and so forth. But just imagine what that could actually mean in practice when we think of parliaments as above all instantiating government and legitimate opposition, as opposed to a bunch of crazies who shout from the sidelines. That's where Europe clearly falls short. You know, all we have is basically a huge grand coalition that, yes, does good work in certain ways maybe, um, but that doesn't allow people to say, here is a clear alternative. As, you know, many political scientists have pointed out, rightly, the problem is that if you really have a problem with anything going wrong in the EU, you have nowhere to go except to populists in the European Parliament and then maybe your own nation state to some degree. And I think that should hopefully change. Now, one word on Germany. Um, sorry, I've been trying to evade, evade your question, of course, um, but I'll try to face it now. So, yes, everybody asks a question about Germany, but I think in certain ways it might be more productive to ask a question about France and about the UK. France has entirely dropped out of the discussions, almost, which would have been unthinkable 10, 20 years ago. It's actually shocking that within Germany itself it has dropped out of the, out of the discussions. Uh, maybe Wolfgang Schäuble, ironically, you know, the bad guy who wants to, you know, kick Greece out of the euro, is the last person in this government, I feel, who still has a certain sensitivity that whatever you do, you talk to Paris first and you make sure that, you know, France is sort of in the same boat and we're doing things, doing things together. If Germany and France had a different kind of relationship and alliance, I think different things might be possible in Europe that Germany on its own can't do. Having said that, there are many things you could imagine France and Germany wanting to do together that the UK is going to veto. So, going back to what you talked, we talked about earlier, you know, do we need a European solution? No, we don't need to construct a federal state tomorrow. This is not a black and white picture, there's not an either or. There are many things one could do in between the usual suspects, financial transaction uh, tax, 
um, more independent budget for the European Commission, etc., etc. Um, that does not amount to all of a sudden entirely disempowering nation states or constructing a European state. But all these things are going to be majorly opposed by the UK. So, I mean, Ivan mentioned, you know, Brexit as one of the as one of as one of the crises. I think it's actually more interesting to talk about this constellation as a whole rather than speculating about you know, the psyche of the Germans. I mean, I'm happy to talk about that too if you want me to, but I'd rather not. Well, just, just a quick thought on, 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 on this, uh, why other drops dropped out. It's, it seems that, well, what, what Ivan mentioned, the debtor creditor relations between more substantial and therefore the political didn't follow, which France perhaps would support and always support it. Uh, I see if you would like to, to react or because actually I, have, I also have a specific question on, on uh, because well in your book and also in a, in a Phil Cogan book, Paper Money, there's well, well documented, uh, it's really well documented how we put our debts from well private or well, financial private uh, poor countries and then, well, rich countries to some extent. And the question is, can we imagine, I was, I was thinking when I was reading your book, I was thinking, it seems that the only viable solution, well, is default. Well, we have to, we will have to default on something, well, whether it's pensions or whether it's debts to, to, well, to the banks or rich countries. But is it possible to imagine the kind of collective default in which to restore sovereignty, it's not the default of Greece, but for example, default of, well, coordinated default of many states at the same time. What would happen? Is it, is it conceivable? Well, I was going to address your initial questions, but I'll start with that one. You know, in 2007-8, policymakers across the Western world decided to take a very different approach to the crisis in the 1930s. Uh, and that was to uh, try and get the economy going again without fundamentally reforming the way it works and without actually tackling the legacy debt issues. And the idea was we'll tackle these issues once we've got the economy going again. And that has yielded better outcomes, at least in the United States, than it has in uh, the 1930s. Um, though the Eurozone is now doing so badly, it's actually doing worse than the 1930s. But the problem with that is that we are trying to, we are trying to get a fundamentally dysfunctional um, uh, economy going again on the same basis with a huge burden of debt, which in the first instance has been shifted from the private sector to the public sector, and now is being shifted across the world. So the only reason we've had global growth for the past few years is because China has been piling on huge amounts of debt, and emerging economies have been piling on huge amounts of debt, and now they can no longer do so. And insofar as we're getting the, the global economy going, uh, is going to survive a, a Chinese slowdown, it's going to be because the United States is growing again and piling on huge amounts of debt. And at some point, you can't keep on passing the parcel. At some time, at point, you need to deal with the issue of an economy that can only grow on the basis of credit. Uh, and can only grow on the basis of credit, which up, uh, over time piles up ever, stock, ever larger stocks of debt, ever gr greater vulnerability to crisis, uh, and ever less ability to deal with a crisis when it comes. And so, while I can understand why you say you don't want to have mass defaults as you had in 2007, in 2000, you, you, you don't want to have mass defaults in 2007-8 as you did in the 1930s, some debt restructuring, gradual, orderly if possible, is absolutely essential. The stock of debt in the world simply is not payable in full. That's true in the United States, it's true in Europe, it's true globally. And at some point we need to uh, tackle this issue. The problem is the political economy. It's quite easy to have debt restructuring at a time when people are about to default, as people were in 2007-8, or indeed as they were in 2010-12 in the Eurozone. Once you've injected enough money in, into the economy that it's going again, it's, it's not doing particularly well, but it's not on the brink of collapse, it's much harder uh, to impose, restrict, impose restructuring afterwards because uh, the creditors will um, strongly uh, resist it. 
So uh, I think we're storing up huge problems for the future, uh, and at some point um, there is going to be um, either a massive financial crisis which forces a big restructuring, or else um, uh, political pressures which achieve that in hopefully uh, a more orderly fashion. In terms of, to come back to the, your, your question before about the nature of the EU, I think you're absolutely right to, start to say it started off as an elite project. It started off with an elite project which was pursuing political aims through technocratic means, and that was probably acceptable in the 1950s, but as national democracies have become more open, uh, and as EU leaders have taken refuge from that by taking more decisions behind closed doors in Brussels, and as the EU has intruded into ever more political matters, so not just agricultural subsidies, but how much governments can tax and spend, then I think that that technocratic method is no longer um, acceptable. And I like the way that Jan contrasted technocracy and populism, because when I worked in Brussels for, for the President of the European Commission, Populism was the big evil, and um, it had to be resisted by, at, you know, at, at all costs. Uh, and people in the Commission felt that, as you said, we know the right path, and the people, the people out there, haven't been enlightened. And if they only did listen to us, everything would be fine. And I love the way, because that's exactly what the populists say, you know, those nasty elitist people uh, in their ivory towers um, or in their chauffeur-driven limousines don't understand what it's like for the people, and if only the voice of the people will listen to, everything is fine. And I agree with you, what we need is, which comes in with what you said, we need a genuine, a genuine politics, a politics which involves choice choice between competing options, choice between competing parties, so both choices, not just one. Um, and if this cannot be done at a European level, uh, then it needs to be done by decentralizing, decentralizing powers back to the national level within a framework of rules, for example, in the single market, but decentralizing powers to the national level where political choice can be exercised. Because I don't think it's desirable or indeed politically sustainable to say that in effect the price of membership of the Euro uh, or of the EU is that you give up fundamental uh, democratic decision making over issues like taxation and spending. I mean that's the, that's the stuff of revolutions, you know, no taxation without representation. Now it can be someone in the Euro group saying you must raise taxes. I don't think that's going to work. It's very then additional, very simple question to, to Ivan, a conclusion from, from what Philip just said. Is post national politics possible, at least in Europe? Let's start with a, a very simple study that has been done in 2010, trying to test what defines the Germans who are ready to support Greek bailout from those who are against. And the interesting thing is what does not matter. Education, not a predicator. Party affiliation, not a predicator. Economic status and especially economic interests, not a predicator. What was interesting about this study was that they have been asking after people answering these questions, they're giving them 100 euro and they said, and here there are 20 charities to which you should decide to give this money to. You should choose the charity. And some of the charities have been local community foundation, basically something in woods. And some have been basically on European level, and some have been kids in Africa. It was altruism, those who were ready to give to the kids in Africa, that basically were ready to support any solidarity. But the problem is that solidarity on European level is almost impossible emotionally to be sustained. Because listen, why are you going to give to the Greeks and not to the Africans who has nothing to eat. And why do you give to the Greeks and not basically to your family or people whom you know personally? So from this point of view, I do believe that solidarity in the EU is always going to be institutional solidarity. You have a lot of redistribution on the level of the institution, but simply to expect to happen what happened on the level of the nation state after such a strong educational process, I do believe it is unrealistic. What was changed as a result of the financial crisis is a different dynamics. Because, uh, and there is a lot of studies being done on this. Support for Brussels was based on trust and mistrust, which means that strangely enough, 
the northerner societies were ready to trust Brussels to the extent that they trusted their own governments. Very strong correlations, basically Germans, Sweden, and others, they trust always their national governments more than they traveled Brussels, trusted Brussels, but they trusted Brussels because they trusted the power of their governments to influence Brussels. Then you come to the Bulgarian Greeks. I do believe at least it was true for Poland 10 years ago, I don't know the data now. Basically, the trust in Brussels was very much the result of mistrust of our national governments. Bulgarians' logic was, we don't know who these people are, but they cannot be more corrupt than ours. So from this point of view, this was this very strong mistrust to the national governments that was allowing people to basically allow Brussels to do certain decisions. I do believe that here, the refugee crisis and also what you are saying about succession and Barcelona are making a major change. When it comes to migration, and it was very clear with the reaction of some of the Central European states, you are not ready to give to Brussels any trust. You are basically going to stay with your government, nevertheless how corrupt it is, even if you believe it's very corrupt. Because you don't believe that they're going to take care of you. And, and when it comes to uh, secession in Brussels, there was this famous book, uh, Rescuing the Nation State about the European Union, and the major argument is, listen, in 1950s and 60s, European nation states have been very much delegitimized as a result of the war. European project was not against the nation state. European Union project was the way to re-legitimize the nation state. For the first time now, with Scotland, with Catalonia and others, we see the level of European integration, which makes for some of these regions legitimate enough to say, I want to be part of the European Union, but I don't see reason to be part of Spain, or I don't see reasons to be part of the United Kingdom. And this is a new development, and for the political elites, to be honest, this is a major problem. This is a new situation. Before European Union was helping to keep these countries together, now the same process of European integration is becoming a threat for the even territorial integrity of some of these countries. Because the logic is, if the borders doesn't matter, if basically self-government is going to be the most important, if regions are more important than the nation states, why we should stay part of Spain? And I do believe this is going to change also very much the view of the elites. I want to make just one last point, and this is the following. What troubles me in the European policy making is not the fact that stupid decisions are taken, because I do believe stupid decisions are taken on different levels by different governments in different times. But democracy is about allowing people to make stupid decisions, but then having enough time for this to be corrected. In fact, the capacity for self-correction is what distinguish the democratic regimes. It is not their capacity to take the right decisions. We created a system in which this process, this capacity for self-correction in a certain way has been very much narrowed. European Union, unlike the nation states, created a situation in which you cannot allow yourself to make a major error. For example, populism. Listen, populism is bad, but populism was always part of democracy, because if you don't have a populist government, you're never going to know what is bad about populist governments. And this is because of your experience that knowing what is bad about the populist government, you're taking one or the other decision. We're trying to create a system in which we're never going to allow the people to make wrong choices. And I find this much more problematic than this technocracy versus populism, because both technocracy and populism are part of a democratic balance. It's going to be changing from time to time. There are different cycles and others. But this is slightly like the economists in the 1990s believe that they are not business cycles anymore. And when you believe that they are not business cycles anymore, when the next crisis comes, this is more disastrous than the normal crisis which basically you expect with the business cycle because you didn't allow certain type of uh, otherwise healthy imbalances uh, to be represented in the economic system, I do believe in the political system. Uh, for example, uh, this is uh, the last, but it's a very Bulgarian experience. We have been changing governments all these years. Never, nobody was ever re-elected in Bulgaria. Uh, and we have been voting for strange people. Uh, and. Uh, and one of those questions was how it is possible in the European Union people to vote like this. Listen, part of the answer is this is exactly the fact that we are in the European Union that gives incentives for people to try to do this. 
they're treating some of these populists in the way you're treating recreational drugs. It's something exotic, but it is not going to be poisonous enough because the European framework exists, and this European framework is not going to allow nothing really bad to happen. I do believe that this is a very kind of a dangerous assumption, and uh, this combination between voters being relaxed, how brave they can be when they're punishing the elites on one side, and on the other side, the elites being extremely precocious, how much choice they're going to the people to make mistakes, create a situation that can be very explosive, and the financial crisis basically make this type of a structural, in my view, problem in the European Union much more dramatic and visible. You can start thinking about the questions, if you have any. Oh yeah, you do. Okay. Będę potrzebował pomocy z mikrofonem. Jeśli tam jest... O, widzę, że ktoś tam nadchodzi. Tak, tak, ale nie, żeby sobie go zaraz zabierać. O, Tomek będzie pełnił honorę, okej. We will, we will turn to the, to the audience uh, for, for, for questions and comments. Uh, just a very short one first from, from, from me. I think this... Uh, yes, yes, uh, I know you enjoy this. Uh, but don't worry, we have plenty of time. Uh, the, I think it's, it's partly on us to blame. I mean, us thinking of me and Ivan uh, being Bulgarian and, and Polish, because when you think about decision-making process with 28 countries now, in comparison to 15 before, well, even 15 was difficult, but well, 6 or, or 12, well, then really the possibility of self-correction is, well, uh, is almost as an authoritarian regime, because the, the renegotiation of anything is, uh, is tedious, or otherwise is very undemocratic, because then you have two or three countries deciding for, for the others and forced to the consensus. And the second thing is that, really, uh, I can't blame Portuguese not to feel, uh, well, not to, not, not to feel the, not to have the fraternité, which is actually really necessary, right? There's brotherhood of some sort to have the common politics with Latvia or, or Poland and the other way around. And the, and the problem is that when I ask about this post-national politics, well, if we, if we cannot create European nationalism, and I wouldn't be afraid to create European nationalism because I would be rather afraid of 28 competing nationalisms because we know the results. But I don't think this is possible, at least for now. However, as we should remember that it was invented and I think it was extremely successful in the 19th century uh, to, to, to change European politics completely. So I wouldn't completely, uh, I mean, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't say it is completely impossible, but I, I, don't see, I don't see how. But the other idea of post-national politics is also pretty old, older than national states, it's empire. But it seems that we in Europe are not prone, and, and I mean not keen to, to play empire role, even British are not anymore, actually, and, and not, to mention, not to mention other states. But perhaps this is another way of doing post-national politics, in which we'll be capable of, if you want to. Um, Okay, but I promised, I promised, uh, I promised questions, so please raise your hands, introduce yourself, and, okay, and ask the question. And we'll collect the questions before answering. Okay, uh, Paweł Zerka, Demos Europa Center for European Strategy. I've got a short, simple, and very open question to all panelists. Uh, it's about last week's um, speech of François Hollande and Angela Merkel in the European Parliament. Uh, François Hollande, he said that it's the moment when Europe, when we need more Europe or we face the risk of having no Europe at all or Europe's collapse. And uh, Angela Merkel repeated that this crisis, referring to the, to the migrants crisis, is the moment where we in fact need more Europe. My simple question would be about your first impressions, reflections, feelings when you heard uh, those words. Okay, thank you. I saw another hand. Please raise it again. Here, yeah, first row. <laughs> 
now it's working. Uh, my name is Anna Nowicka. I'm a feminist activist and, and a unionist in a, in a corporation that has ser shared services here in Łódź. Um, you were saying about a vision that Europe needs. I have two visions. One is of the past, and that is that the European Union was created as a business project. And you were talking, although excusing yourself all the time, with this managerial terminology because there was no way, no way out. There is no other way because it was a business project. And then you mentioned uh, human rights. But the human rights is just a CSR in that European corporation. That's my vision of the European project so far. Well, it must have been that way because only economists were allowed to create it. Now, it's been used, and now I think this joint venture is ready to be dissolved. Um, I'm using my own personal experience to analyze the situation. I am a mother of two sons. One is an artist, a lousy student, and very good with his pocket money. The other one is a sportsman excellent student and has no idea what to do with his money. He just loses it on the first day that he receives it. Both in their own right are decent young people. And I have this motherly vision of the European Union as a family. This is something that's not to be dissolved when you're, when you're tired. Because we're not able as nations to move out of this house forever. We'll still be kin. So I think if you need a new vision of this project, you need to allow a mother on your panel. Thank you. Just for the record, I don't think anyone said that the European Union was a business project, because if it were a business project, if it would be long bankrupt long ago. Uh, maybe technocratic, elitist, but business, no. No, that's what I said. Ah, you said. Okay, sorry. This was my misunderstanding. Okay, do we have another? Do I see the hand over there? Yes, okay. Hello, my name is Hans Labacowski from Czech Republic. I have a rather theoretical question to the panelists. Would it help? Um, I, maybe first to put the context, I very much agree with the, with, uh, the problem of interdependence uh, in, in um, end result uh, limiting our choice and our sovereignty. Would it help uh, if uh, the member states wouldn't have public debts? Would it make the situation different in, in public elections, parliament elections? I mean, now it's a purely theoretical question. Just imagine that Greece doesn't have public debts. Would it, would it make it easier for people to change governments? Or is the level of complexity of our modern world still so high and we are still so interdependent by commerce, by trade, by other things, that still we would be limited in, in, the, choi in the choice, if you understand my question, what I mean? Right, I did, but let's, let's see if they did as well. Uh, and okay, if, we, there, if, there are no, if there are no questions, then We'll, we'll end up uh, with your answers and perhaps, well, this time in the opposite way, if you agree. And uh, we have, well, we have uh, like, uh, okay, let's make it like five minutes each, if you can. No, I'll just try to make uh, uh, three points and to touch of, uh, the first is what I make of all this more Europe. Listen, I don't know what more Europe means because for different people it means totally different things. Uh, one thing changed profoundly as a result of the Ukraine crisis and the refugee crisis. Till a year ago, two years ago, European Union was looking at its neighborhood as a place that it is shaping. For good or for bad, we're doing this better or worse. But this was our perception, how it functions. We are there to change our neighbors. As a result of the refugee crisis, and as a result of the Russia-Ukrainian crisis, now European Union feels very much the hostage of its neighbors. Just to give you an example, imagine we're going to have elections in Turkey on November 1st. Imagine that this is going to be a rigged elections. Imagine that one million people will go on the streets of Istanbul. Do you believe that European Union can afford to say a critical word 
towards Mr. Erdogan at the moment in which basically the only chance of stopping the migrants from the point of view of the German government is to have a deal with Turkey as it is. Normally, two weeks before the elections, you don't visit a country. Mrs. Merkel, who is not famous for her pro-Turkish sentiments for the last 10 years, is going today or tomorrow to Turkey because this is what the hostages are doing. You're trying basically to buy out yourself. The same goes uh, on the Russia-Ukrainian side where it's not the refugee, it's much more any type of military activity and others which are going to put the European Union in disarray and here France and Germany does not look at the same way. I'm saying this because just saying more Europe does not mean much. Uh, this is some of these magic words which is good to be said, I don't believe it's, you're not hurting anybody saying this, but in this moment the basic problem is what you really want to achieve, what you are fighting for, what is your time perspective. And here going to the, uh, by the way, on the mothers on the uh, podium, I totally agree here. The only, uh, the only excuse that we have is that it was not ourselves who decided to be on the panel. You should attack the moderator. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> But on the interdependency complexity story, I very much agree that even if all the countries are not going to have that, if even they are going to stay in the, cards, uh, in the rules paradigm, uh, the level of interdependency is changing our lives, and this is changing our lives not only on the level of states, but also on the level of everyday life. What is happening was that after World War I, the major story was we're changing borders in order to create a legitimate functioning entities. After World War II, the idea was let's change borders as less as possible, but we're going to exchange population. We're creating ethnic homogeneity in order to legitimize the states. After basically the end of the Cold War, the idea was we're changing the nature of the borders. And everything good and everything bad comes from this. It was opening of the borders that allowed all of us to be here in a way. It is opening of the borders that basically are part of the problems that we are facing, I don't mean only immigration, but also go on the level of disease, go on the level of capital flows and others. It is impossible to distinguish between the positive and the negative aspects of interdependency. But here there is one warning which is coming from those who are doing historical empirical work on interdependency. There was a book being published uh, uh, recently, and the major argument based on almost 200 uh, years of history of how interdependence works in the security area is that when the actors have a positive view on the future, interdependency reduces the risk of war. But if the actors started to have a negative perceptions of the future, interdependency increases the risk of war. And I do believe we are on this very kind of a threshold moment in which either we're going to reshape interdependence in the way to make it less threatening, or this same interdependence, which till yesterday was our major achievement, today really is going to be uh, the major threats. Uh, and I'm coming to the last point, which is based on uh, uh, one more uh, uh, survey that I want to, uh, to communicate. The other thing with this global world that has happened is that it's very much changed our frame of comparisons. Today, when you decide, are you doing fine or are you doing bad, with whom you compare? For example, in the 1980s, we have these well-known world value surveys, and they have been surveying how, surveying how happy are people in the world. And in 1980, they discovered that Nigerians and West Germans were equally happy. Economic wealth, West Germans was then, did not have any type of a strong positive correlation with happiness. 20 years later, the same survey, the same questions, Nigerians were as happy as the, their GDP will predict. What was happened? Interconnection, television, Nigerians for the first time see how West Germans live. So from this point of view, we're also living in the world in which global comparisons are making people restless. For example, Bulgarian doctor, who is doing better than he was doing before 1989 by any comparison? But he's not comparing himself anymore, neither with his situation of before 1989, nor with basically the family of the nurse he's working with. He's comparing himself with uh, the doctor in the United States or in Germany, and he feels unhappy. And I do believe that part of the dyna dynamism of the modern world, but also part of a profound unhappiness that we see, 
has something to do with this type of a new form of dictatorship, and this is the dictatorship of comparisons. Thank you, Ivan. And just in defense of gender imbalance on panel, uh, actually there were not that many women who wanted to travel for, for a day to speak for an hour. Uh, well, men did. Which but means that there were not enough fathers who were ready to take care of the kids. That's, that's exactly. This is the, so I think this is the well, gender problem that the world has. Uh, and so do we. Uh, anyway, uh, Jan Werner, please. The floor is yours. I was only allowed to travel because I promised that I, there might be a small chance that I might meet somebody with the name Lewandowski, even if it was the wrong one, uh, because one of my kids is very much into soccer, of course, or football. <laughs> um, allow me to finish on a rather dry, abstract, theoretical, conceptual note. Um, so, populism and technocracy, which kind of came back in the discussion a little bit. Um, maybe it's, it's worth spending just a more, one more second on populism. I didn't mean it in the sense of, you know, this is what ordinary people really think or this is what the demos really wants. Um, for me to be a populist, it's not enough to be anti-elitist or to criticize elites. Because by that definition, all of us who ever find fault with any existing elites automatically become populists. And that can't be right. So in addition to being anti-elitist, you also have to be an anti-pluralist. You basically have to say, we and only we properly represent the people, the nation, whatever it might be. Um, and we can all think of leaders who've basically said exactly that, and therefore entirely delegitimized, or tried to delegitimize uh, any other public contender, delegitimized any idea of legitimate opposition, and so on and so forth. That's why, for me at least, populism is not just a legitimate variety within democracy. It's actually something that is always in danger of slipping into authoritarianism. Now, at the same time, populism and the far right are not the same thing. You can be a populist without necessarily being a xenophobe, exaggerated nationalism, and so on and so forth, because you might set up your anti-pluralism in a different kind of, different kind of way. Um, just one brief example, if I may. Some of you may remember these, uh, these fantastic placards which the American Tea Party featured at one point. Uh, when they said, redistribute my work ethic. Because they went out of their way to say, you know, we're not racist, we're not American nationalists, you know, we just basically distinguish between people who work and people who don't work. Now, obviously, in the American context, as in many other contexts, that actually easily comes with ethnic connotations and so on, but that's the kind of move where you might say, well, look, this is not obviously quite the same as the far right. Having said that, of course they can go together. So. In Hungary, for instance, I would say we now have a government that is both populist and far right at the same at the same time. Um, it was arguably it wasn't far right until this year when they basically started this top-down hate campaign with posters against refugees and and so on and so forth. So therefore, I think we we need to be careful about how we sort of talk about wanting more democracy. Um, and this very much came up also with Syriza, of course, in, in in a certain way. We sometimes said we are populists, but who were actually, at least in my book not necessarily anti-pluralists, and therefore shouldn't be tarred with the same brush. I mean, Philippe told us about how in the commission there's a siege mentality that, you know, there are all these populists out there who are going to sort of, you know, the masses are going to overrun, you know, good governance somehow. We should carefully distinguish between different actors and what they want and how they talk and how they fit or rather don't fit into democracy. One very last point, if I may, just to try to end on a happy note. Um, so we've talked a lot about constraints, uh, the fact that Democrats, as Ivan, as Ivan pointed out, we used to pride ourselves on our ability for self-correction, uh, also our ability, of course, to make choices in the first place. All this is true. At the same time, we have to be very careful what we're actually comparing with. If you just think back to the already much maligned 1950s when everything was elitist, I mean, there were so many constraints on what you could do as a democracy, starting with the Cold War. Now, that's not a, a normative point, just an empirical point. So, unlike people who talk about post-democracy now, in contrast to democracy that we used to have, you have to be very careful, you know, how far these comparisons really take us. I mean, do we really want to go back to the 1950s when, obviously, women were largely excluded from politics in meaningful ways, when certain issues couldn't even be brought on the table because it would have been unthinkable to talk about certain social issues as a matter of politics and so on and so forth. So, just to try to end on a somewhat more positive note. <laughs>
In answer to the question about Merkel and Hollande, I mean, I think the statement, more Europe or no Europe at all, is completely vacuous. And if that is really the level of their thinking, then no wonder Europe is in a mess. I mean, the really important issue is, if you're going to talk about Europe, what kind of Europe? Or at a more basic level, um, what is the most appropriate, effective, um, and uh, acceptable response? To frame it in that way is frankly moronic. Um, and it explains why when you try to criticize the way that the EU makes decisions or its rules or its institutions, you are immediately framed as anti-European, as if somehow um, there's only one um, way in which one can be European um, or there's only um, one true path. And I think, well, it seems to me, the solution to the refugee crisis doesn't necessarily have to involve more Europe. It has to involve something um, which is actually effective at tackling it. So much more fundamental than whether more Europe or, or less Europe is can we persuade Europeans that admitting refugees is an investment that can pay dividends? And can one try and change the narrative about refugees in a much more positive direction? If one can do so, then it doesn't really matter that much whether the response is national or European. If Germans perceive welcoming refugees as being in their national interest a positive thing, then what Hungary does, or what Poland does, or what Britain does, frankly, is secondary. Uh, and if everyone can agree um, that admitting more refugees is a good thing, then most likely the end result of that will be more of a European policy. But it would flow from the conclusion that admitting more refugees is a good thing, rather than being imposed as more Europe is necessary and therefore we're going to try and uh, impose this uh, and without actually winning the actually the fundamental argument which ought, ought to be the precondition for moving forward on that basis. And I'm not sure if that's clear, but uh, I think that it's, it, 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 it is actually missing the point about what, of what the crisis um, uh, is about. In terms of the Czech gentleman who talked about whether public debt is the constraint on having choice. I mean, clearly not outside the Eurozone. Uh, there is ample policy choice for Britain, the United States, Poland, um, with varying levels of uh, public debt. Uh, likewise, you see that political, political choice was constrained even for those countries which in the pre-crisis years did not run up uh, large public debts like Spain and Italy. Um, the crucial thing which has led to the constraining of policy choice is first um, that the Eurozone led to cross-border bank lending and secondly the intimate links that exist between uh, banks and the political system. Banks being seen either as national champions or as political piggy banks for governments, for politicians to do with um, as they choose. And if you add the combination of cross-border bank lending and close links between governments and banks, and a third element, which is that some governments are more powerful than others, then a crisis where French and German banks lend badly, partly to the private sector, but partly by buying public debt, and then get into trouble, uh, they can call on their governments and their governments can then use their control over EU institutions to foist um, the costs of that bad lending by private banks onto the citizens um, uh, of other countries' governments, or the governments of other, country, of other countries. That is the fundamental issue. That is the fundamental issue. And uh, I don't think actually well, the aim of I was part of the the aim of creating the banking union was to break the links 
at least officially, was to break the links between governments and banks. And somehow, if you did that, uh, then you would be able to have um, uh, a Eurozone where the f their fates were no longer intertwined, where conceivably one could resolve banks, where conceivably one could write down debts. And the bad news is that the banking union really hasn't achieved that at all. And the links between governments and banks, which work in both directions, banks matter uh, to governments uh, because they buy their debt, and governments matter to banks because they bail them out in a crisis. Those links are as strong as ever. The banking union uh, is a joke. Uh, and uh, you can be pretty sure that in any crisis that happens again in the next 5, 10, 20 years, most likely the political economy of how it plays out in the Eurozone, assuming the Eurozone still exists, will be exactly uh, as it was uh, during uh, this current crisis. If I, if I would try to, which is unfashionable anymore, to, to conclude, then I would say that, uh, well, we need more politics or politicization of the European Union and we need definitely more choice. And if we are not ready to do this, we need to take a step back. And however, it also struck me from the context of our discussion um, that to what extent the both European Union and liberal democracy are the products of very specific historical conditions, geopolitical as well, which are not necessarily given for forever, and uh, we are not really sure if both of them can survive different set of conditions, and will, well, unlike what Fukuyama thought, might not be the final product of the of the history. Uh, but I, I, I promise, Jan Werner, a quick, right? I don't want to save you, but just one quick word, God forbid, in defense of Merkel and Hollande and what they did last week. I agree with Philippe that, you know, it's crazy to say whoever criticizes them or Brussels in general automatically must be an anti-European. I mean, again, that goes back to the point that you must be allowed to criticize elites without being called a populist. But I think they were right about one thing. They were right about the fact that the migration, that basically the refugee crisis is a godsend for populists, for the far right, for everybody. Because all of a sudden it allows the amalgamation of being anti Brussels and roughly speaking anti foreigner in the name of identity politics in a way that UKIP has already been doing it in the UK. Right? This is an anti European party in the name of identity politics, not in terms of real interests, but what they, all they ever talk about is migration. Um, so they've already been doing this for years. All of a sudden, all of Europe could become like this. And everybody will say, yes, it's true, it's a, it's a big issue. And people are already thinking that somehow Brussels is to blame for the refugee crisis, which is complete nonsense, right? But, in, but all of a sudden, this takes hold as an idea. And I think Macron and Hollande were right to say, if that takes hold in people's imagination, it's a dangerous moment. That's all. Well, my reaction was uh, irrelevant, unfortunately. Um, but maybe it says something about me, not the European politics. So, okay, but concluding, not in a, not in a uh, really uh, like up-down mood, I, I think, honestly, that having such a, well, I don't fear to use the word enlightened panel here, well, even if it changes mind of one of you or, or, or give you something to think, and it's a, well, it's gonna be the right person, right? Because all about the freedom gains is that we don't want to talk to many, we just want to the chosen ones. And it's a, we feel that's a good investment. So I, 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 truly, I truly feel that if we, uh, this kind of inner, kind of like an inner thoughts about the situation we're all in, and then taking action, because I believe that, well, words on this stage will be useless if we are not, if we cannot turn them back home, wherever we are, into action would be useless. This kind of debates about liberal democracy, about Europe, about, well, consequence of financial crisis, this is, uh, this is what we should be doing, even if Poland uh, uh, seems to, to escape the financial crisis and its consequences. Well, we didn't. And so we did not escape the consequences of war in Syria, and we did not escape the consequences of, of war in Ukraine. So I would like here to, to thank very much Jan Werner Miller, Philip Legren, Ivan Krastev. Thank you so much.